Any other ones? We got the comforter. We got counselor. Sorry? Spirit of holiness. Spirit of holiness? I haven't heard that one, but you know what? I would say amen. How about teacher? Anything else? Anybody else got one? I got one more. Sorry? I got the comforter. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you can't read my writing. Sorry. Helper. Reminder. A reminder. You can do that too. So I started looking at, just looking at the Trinity and looking at what, what would be the role of the Holy Spirit in us. Like, is there a role for the Holy Spirit in us? And I'm realizing when you go through Scripture and you read, and I've got a number of Scriptures I wanted to go through, there is a major role that the Holy Spirit plays in our lives. First and foremost, those that have made that confession of faith and have been baptized upon, well, the baptism is not what necessarily has to happen, but the fact is, is that you've made that confession of faith and you've been regenerated, born again. God gives you the Holy Spirit. And that is actually the seal to know that I'm a child of God. But the thing is, the Holy Spirit itself, we know that Jesus was a person. God himself is a person. The Holy Spirit also is a person as well. And there are things that the, the, uh, the Holy Spirit can be. You know, in Acts, it talks about when Stephen was about to be martyred. He was giving his testimony, and he testified to the Jews that, you know what? You resist the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was trying to teach them something different, but yet they were resisting him. So oh, it's kind of hard to identify the Holy Spirit as an it or an entity. It's actually a person. Jesus himself identifies the Holy Spirit as a person. God himself, it's part because of the Trinity, the three in one, God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, three in one, but three different parts. In Thessalonians, it talks about you can even quench the Spirit. And in uh, Ephesians, Paul talks about, about grieving the Spirit, which I want to go through some of these things. But I wanted to go, when you start talking about the Holy Ghost, and again, we're back in John, which we're going through together. And in John 14, starting at verse 15, this is where Jesus, it's getting close to the end of his life. He's already had the Passover. Judas has left. And he's with the remaining disciples that he's got left. And he's teaching them all that he's going to teach them before he's going to be crucified. And it starts at uh, John 14, 15. It says that if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But you know him, for he dwelleth in you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. But yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. But ye see me, because I, I live, and ye shall live, and ye shall live also. And then we go a little bit further. He talks again. Jesus answered, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him. And he will come unto me, uh, come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but of the Father which sent me. These things I have spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you, not my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, Give I unto you, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Because Jesus is right now as identified that he is going to leave. And the disciples are not understanding exactly what's going on. He's already told them in the past that he's going to die. But the fact is, is that Jesus is saying that I need to go so that I can bring forth, that the God's going to bring forth the comforter. It's needful for me to go 
that the Holy Spirit would come and dwell. The Holy Spirit's always been there. But the difference what's going to happen is that in the Old Testament, and I guess the best way to explain it, was God is pouring out a spirit in the Old Testament. And it would be like a cup turned upside down. And you could pour water on that cup, and that cup's going to get wet, and it's going to get everybody else around. And if you think about the story when uh, Saul was after David, and David hides in the house of the prophets. And Saul sends out some soldiers. And what do they end up doing when they get there? They end up prophesying. Because the Holy Spirit was being poured out where they were. And these soldiers couldn't help themselves but to prophesy. Because God's Spirit was there. Not once, but twice. Then Saul himself goes over there with the intent to kill this man. But yet again, he ends up repenting and prophesying and going back home. The difference with the New Testament is that cup is now turned upside down. And when God pours it forth, now the indwelling spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, the comforter, the Holy Ghost, the spirit of God, the counselor, the spirit of holiness, the teacher, helper, and reminder can now dwell with inside of you. That's a beautiful thing. That's the difference between Old and New Testament. That's one of the works that Jesus did. So that we could be restored back to God. That our sins would be forgiven. And that barrier and bond has been broken free. That now we can be restored, maybe not in full, but in part, walking here on this earth, back into the presence of God. Does that not move you? Does that not stir in your hearts? But the question is, is that why do I still feel the same way I feel? Why am I being tempted and falling short? Why do I get nervous? Why do all these things that come about? Because you know what? While we live on this earth, we know bones will break. People are going to get sick. Things are going to happen. But the question is going to be is that when the indwelling spirit of God is in you, how are you going to respond to all these things? Because these things are going to happen. These things, you know what? Welcoming everyone here. Yeah, you're right. You know what? It's going to get to the point where Christians aren't going to be welcomed so much. And it's already happening. But we ourselves are supposed to welcome each other. And I think, you know what, when I, when I look at what scriptures there are, and I want to just go through a few of these scriptures here, and I'm going to be bouncing back and forth, so um, you may not be able to keep up with me. But, you know, I look in the book of Acts, right in the very beginning, and it says that, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and all the end of the earth. This is where they are going to receive. Stay here. Jesus is promising something. He's promising the Holy Spirit. And when this spirit will come upon you and it's going to fill you, you will become my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the ends of the earth. When we get born again and get that experience, how many here just want to testify of what God's done? You remember that born again experience that you had, that newness of life, that freshness, there was excitement, there was zeal. You know what? That's the Holy Spirit filling you up. And it's like, you know what? I got nothing else to do but to say something. I want to say what God's done in my life. How many here have that? How many here remember that? Let's put it that way. How many remember that? But you know, why isn't it the same? Why isn't it the same? You know what? We received the Holy Spirit. But you know what? We need to be filled. This is the thing. This is why it is wonderful that God has done this plan, but we're not called to just stay there. Now we need to grow. We need to be filled continually. You will receive it. And then you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem in our households, in Judea, our neighborhood, in our workplaces, Samaria, and all the other outer parts of the earth, Africa, Argentina, the things that we're talking about, all these outer places. In John 15, it says that when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. The Holy Spirit itself doesn't identify or want any credit. The Holy Spirit is pointing to Jesus. The words of Jesus himself, it's like, the Holy Spirit's intent is to help remind you, to show you, to direct you, to look to the name of Jesus, to look to the man, the man who's accomplished all things. Romans 15. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. How many here have hope? What's your hope in? Let me ask that question. In Christ Jesus, you know that this world is only temporal. We have got a place in eternity that has been prepared for us. 
some sort of mansion. I don't know. But you know what? There's a place that's going to be prepared for us, and we're going to spend eternity with the Father and the Son and with each other. Hallelujah. He's coming. And this Holy Spirit is going to bear witness of the name of Jesus and direct us. Romans 15 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. That's the hope. It's not if, it's when. It's the confidence that we can have with the Holy Spirit going through us, living in us, filling us up, that we may have that power and that hope and that confidence, not in ourselves. How many here can stand on their own two feet and be a Christian? Oh, yeah, I better not put my... <laughs> No, that isn't the case. But you know what? John 15 says that in of myself, we can do nothing unless we abide in the vine. And that Holy Spirit is the one that points us to Jesus so that we may bear the fruits that he's called us to bear. In Luke, if you then, these are the words of Jesus, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit to those that are asking him? He's willing to give it freely. I know every dad here, if your children are hungry, you would give them what they need. Every dad here, the reason why we're working is providing for our families and doing the things that we do for them. If we, who are evil, uh, that was a little hard one to follow, but anyway. But we know how to give good gifts to our children. Even the world knows how to give good gifts to children. Even the world knows how to give good gifts to hospitals and everything else, but they're all seeking credit for themselves. But you know what? The Father himself desires to give us this gift, the Holy Spirit. And especially now that Jesus has paved the way that we can now be reconciled back to God, that our cups are turned upside down the way they should have been in the beginning, in the Garden of Eden. But because of sin, they got turned upside down. I know that whole term about being ebayubakt, born again, you know, you're all, you're, you're upside down. You know what? We got it right side up. The cups are facing the right way now. And now we're able to receive what God has planned for us in his Holy Spirit, that while we're living here on this earth we may have that privilege and walking in the newness of life and having the victory in sin in corinthians or do you not know that your body is a temple of the holy spirit within you of whom you have from god you are not your own these earthen vessels are temples for the holy spirit i know i've got into some conversations where you get into, you know, what sin? Is smoking sin? Is drinking sin? You know, tattoos, are they sin? Earrings, piercings, all these things are coming in. And it's like, are these sin? Are, are these? But you know what? You're missing the point. You are focused on the water getting stirred and waiting for something to happen. You have missed the point. These things need to be put aside. It's not about what I can and cannot get away with. It's about who can I glorify? What am I doing? Where am I going? I find sometimes our focus can be so misguided, so misdirected in what we can and cannot do, we're, we're missing the point. We're missing the anointing of God. And we're so focused on what we can and cannot do and what we can get away with and what we can't and what we'll do in secret so that the church doesn't see us or our family doesn't see us or even your wives or whatever it may be that you're doing in secret. It will be exposed. But this is not what it's about. It's all about him. It's about Jesus. In Acts, being therefore exalted at the right hand and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Peter, this is a sermon. They've just been baptized by the Holy Spirit in the upper room, and he is now preaching to a large number of people. And he is telling them, this is what God has done. This has been a promise in the Old Testament that he was going to pour out his spirit upon man. And now our cups are the right way to receive what he's got for us. No longer are they upside down, but they're right side up. That we may be able to be filled. And you're seeing what's going on. And of course, they had tongues of fire on them. They were speaking in tongues. They were doing, they were magnifying the Lord and prophesying. In Acts 13, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart to me. Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I had called them. They were gathering together. There was a work that needed to be called. And again, back in the days, they always cast lots in the Old Testament. And the last time you hear of the casting of lots, and I'm not sure how the whole lot thing went, short straw, roll the dice, 
uh, number between one and 10. I'm not sure how that all worked. But when they were picking the last disciple, they cast lots for Matthias. And that's the last I ever hear of them casting lots. After that, they've received the Holy Spirit. And now they come together. They're fasting and they're praying. They're asking for, we need to send somebody out. And who is it that talks to them? It is the Holy Spirit that sets apart Barnabas and Saul. And a lot of times, that, these are the things that we need. When we're looking at mission fields and such like that, are we seeking the Holy Spirit to talk to us? And allowing, or is it just on, among feelings? And it's like, you know what, I feel that I want to change in life. And you know what, I want to, I'd be willing to go. That's not the person, people we want to send. We want the people that the Holy Spirit is saying, you're the one that's going to go. The question is, are we yielded to do that thing? John 16, it says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I don't go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send to you. That's Jesus himself again. The tail end of his life, before he's about to be crucified, it's to my, your advantage that I leave. A lot of times, again, if you've got somebody in school, and mom's there, let's just, we'll use mom for homeschooling and teaching, and mom's there helping you along, helping you along, helping you along. There's a certain point where mom's got to get out of the picture, and you got to do it on your own. You got to do it on your own. Otherwise, you're not going to learn. And there's a point, too, that they were under Jesus' teaching, his anointing, his blessing, his presence, everything else. But unless he goes away, they're not going to experience the Holy Spirit. And then they're not going to experience, again, Jesus is still there, and he's still pointing to him. But these things that they, he needed to go away. In Titus, he saved us, not because of the works done by us in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. How many here can say they got saved by their works? Nobody? Nobody's brave enough? Good, because I would have told you to repent. <laughs> you need to get born again. <laughs> in of ourselves, we can do nothing. There is no righteousness that we can present to God to say we are good enough to be part of the kingdom of God. Nothing we can do. We must understand and know that we have all fall short of the glory of God, and we need Jesus Christ. We need the regeneration of what he has done and that Holy Spirit to indwell in us and to show us and to prove us and give us the ability and power to walk in the Christian walk. There's nothing we've done in ourselves, and it is only by God's mercy that he washes us, cleanses us from all unrighteousness, and gives us the Holy Spirit to dwell within us. Romans 5, and the hope does not put us to shame because God's love has poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who, is, who has been given to us. That hope, nobody here, how many here are ashamed of Jesus? I pray there'd be nobody here because I'll tell you right now, if you're ashamed of him here, he will be ashamed. He will not testify of your name in heaven. He will not announce it to the other angels. That's where I was hoping you were going to go with that, Melvin. <laughs> He's not going to announce it to the other angels. Because you know what? If we're not willing to testify of him here, I'm not sure what reason would there be to testify later. Are we ashamed of the fear of men, of what people would might think who we are? Are we crazy? Are we going to potentially lose friends? Well, you know what? Unless we're not willing to forsake mother, father, for my name's sake, you're not worthy to be one of my disciples. I go on back into Acts again. It says, and we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Simply yielding to God's plan and accepting his way. And it's one of these things where, you, and because we, of course, we've always known, most of us here have grown up in Christian homes and acknowledge God, the creator, and all these things. But why is it that the blood and sin, why must sin be atoned? Why must there be shedding of blood? Why must all these things come to pass? And we don't question these things because we've just grown up with it. It's just a hobby dog. But there are those in this world that would question, why did a man have to die for sins of this world? And who is to dictate what is sin? What's sin in your eyes and my eyes may not be the same. Who is the one that does that? And this is where God's plan is definite. God had a plan for this world before the foundation of this world. He had a plan. The question is whether it seems foolish or not, from a human's perspective, who wants to be on board? Who wants to be on board of God's plan? Because he has a plan for mankind. He does. And it's through his son, Jesus Christ. That was his plan. This world would count it foolishness. The gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing. But unto us, it's life. It's life.
Where was I? And the hope, oh yeah, that's right. In Acts chapter 5 again, and we are witnesses to these things, and so the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to us, will obey him. Again, that yielded spirit. Romans in Romans chapter 8. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. There are times, there are times when, again, we're weak, whether it be in temptation. But I tell you, you know what? The comforter is here, right there. You're not going to be exempt from going through trials. But the comforter will be there as you go through these trials. He will be there to support you. He will be there to comfort you. He will be there to direct you and just build you up. Because if you don't have him, you're by yourself. And you may be trying to find comfort in friends, peers. But you know what? I hope you don't get friends like Job. He had some pretty unfriendly friends. <laughs> Curse God and die. <laughs> That's the wife. That was it. I hope you don't have wives like that either. But anyway, <clears throat> but we want the comforter. We want him to be the one doing these things. For no prophecy in second Peter, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along with the Holy Spirit. Peter is talking about prophecy, being able to bear and testify of the mighty works of God. You know what? In a man itself, I'm sorry, you're on your own. But you know what? Men spoke as inspired and being filled with the Holy Ghost that these words start coming out. A lot of times you may find yourself, and again, I don't know if this is your testimony or not, but I've found myself when I'm sharing with somebody um, that somehow, you know what, recently we went away on a weekend and I ended up talking to a waitress and I ended up talking to her a lot longer than I anticipated. The rest of the family had left. And I ended up talking to her. Her boss had told her she needs to get back to work. But she seemed to be so longing to hear what I was saying. And when it came down to it, my wife asked me, so what did you talk to her about? And I said, I honestly don't know. I just started talking and realized the words that were coming, I, I, I don't know how to explain it. I don't know if that's been a testimony for any of you, that you've had this where it's like, I don't know really what happened, but I know that God was glorified in this. And that a lot of times if we can be, they allow the Holy Spirit to do that because the Holy Spirit's only going to remind you of the things that Jesus said. And the Holy Spirit's going to guide you and teach you. These are the things I want to say. And many times we may find ourselves, when, when, when? Well, you know what? When the time comes, I'll give it to you. When the time comes, I'll give it to you. Again, back in Acts chapter 4. Again, they were going through some trials and, they were play and when they had prayed, they were in jail. We're talking... Uh, Paul, I think it was Paul and Barnabas or Paul and Silas. I can't remember which one this was. And when they had prayed, the place in which they had gathered together were shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. No, this was not in jail. This is when after they had re just received persecution. Do not speak in the name of Jesus. Let them go. They came back and they got to testify to the rest of the brothers. And when they had prayed... The place was shaken. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to keep going, speaking the words of God with boldness, not afraid, even though they were just told, don't do it. But they're not afraid. How many here want to be empowered by that Holy Spirit, want to be filled with that Holy Spirit? Because you know what? Your cup can't run over unless it gets full. That's the problem. Too many of us have the Holy Spirit, and that's they're satisfied with it. But that's not where God wants us. He wants us to grow. He wants us to move on. He wants us to prosper. He wants us to be blessed. And you know what? This is why the Holy Spirit has been given to us, that we may dwell with him, and he dwells with us. Difference between old and new, cup upside down or upside backwards. In Mark 13, and when they bring you to trial, words of Jesus, and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand of what you will say, but say whatever is given to you at that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. This is the times where sometimes we're asking for it. The Lord will give it to us when the time comes. I know that we aren't there, but there's been opportunities. You know what? Sometimes we just need to start. Sometimes you need to throw your caster net in and watch what God will do. Sometimes bring those five loaves and two fishes and see what he's going to do with it. But you got to do your part. you got to come forth. 
Yes, you know what? Maybe getting up early in the morning to come to a prayer meeting is a bit tough to do. But you know what? It takes effort because you won't regret it. Nobody goes home after a prayer meeting. Oh, that was boring. That was terrible. You know what? In that case, I'd question whether the Holy Spirit's dwelling in you. But the majority of time we get together, whether it's in prayer or in church this morning, gathered together, going home, we are built up and edified because we're gathering together, building up our faith, strengthening us, allowing the Holy Spirit to say, yes, amen. That he's not limited to just one person. He can do this in this whole room. He can move and live and dwell and fill and overflow in this whole room, individually and collectively. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, these things God has revealed uh, to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. How can we get to know God better? Uh, you know what? Allow the indwelling Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, Spirit of God to live in us, and He will show us who God is. And we're going to realize how little we are. And what great magnitude there is. In Matthew 28. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Or sorry, Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Those are the words of Jesus himself. Commanding. This is what we're called to do. We want to baptize. We want to first make disciples in all nations. Bring them. Show them. Bring them to the, the Lord. And baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So that they now have their cup turned and are ready to receive, to be anointed. Because Jesus is going to be with us until the end of age. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. This is where it's all about the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing. That's really what it is. Unless we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us... <laughs> Church really is silly. It's just a club meeting. It can be anything else. You know what? It, it, we'd be no different than hell's angels gathering together and doing their thing. There's no difference. That's what the world sees this being. But there isn't. It isn't that. It is so much more. And all of us would testify. Those that have experienced and know what God has done through his son, Jesus Christ, would say, amen. It is way more than that. Way more than that. And I got something to share with you. You're worshiping the wrong God. You, you need to know Jesus. You need to know what he's got to offer you because it'll be way better than what this world has to offer in any club form or any social group that you have. In Jude, chapter one, but you, beloved, I like it when Jude says that. How many here feel beloved? You are. Whether you feel like it or not, you are. You're beloved. Those you guys are the children of God. You've been identified. You've been cleansed and regenerated. You are beloved in the eyes of the Lord. So how many here feel beloved? Stop feeling. You are. Hands up, everybody. You are beloved. Beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. That's what it's about. You know what? We have to understand and know who we are in Christ. We are beloved because he died for you. He died for you, for me. My sins have been nailed on the cross. My sins have been blotted out. I've been taken care of. It's all done. And now I am beloved before God. And he wants to fill me with his spirit, a part of him in me, dwelling in me while I'm on this earth. Until one day we get to be with him for eternity. Yeah. Then <laughs> that's another story altogether. In Ephesians chapter one, in him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, you were sealed with the promise. Holy Spirit. That there, when you believed faith comes by hearing of the word. And I'm praying anybody here that does not know the Lord Jesus Christ personally and what he has done for you. Children, I know, you know what? What, uh, what Melvin was saying too, that there are angels protecting you and there's a time coming. And I pray like when Jesus said to the fishermen, drop your nets and come follow me, that you would be doing the same thing. But there are angels that are protecting you for a season. I will testify 
Before I got born again, I know there were angels protecting for me because I should have been dead. Two times I should have been dead. But no, there was an angel protecting me for this very reason that I got saved. I got born again. I threw all those things aside. And now I'm here where I am today, maybe for this very reason. I don't know. But the fact is, is that, you know what? The gospel message is truly, it's a salvation for those that believe. And he seals us with his Holy Spirit. In 2 Timothy, for God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. The Holy Spirit itself can give us, a lot of times when we don't know something or when we're unsure, there's a sense of fear. There's a sense of fear. You know what, I, I kind of tease my children a little bit when they're going to go feed the animals at night. I mean, it's dark outside. Just make sure you run to the barn quickly so the coyotes don't get you. And whoever's the slowest is on the menu. So just make sure who's, who's the quickest to get there. And you know what, there's that, of course, now we laugh at it, but it's just that sense of fear that the unknown, is there, is there, is there something out there to come get me? Is there? There's only been one time where they actually had that occurrence, where they opened the door and there was a coyote there. Oh, <laughs> slam the door. <laughs> so ever since then, I've milked it. <laughs> but nonetheless, it's when we have that, when we don't know. And the thing is, though, God does not want us to not know. He has given us the mysteries of the gospel. We can know. And perfect love will cast out that fear. His love will cast out that fear. And God gave us the spirit, the Holy Spirit, that we can know and have that confidence in him. And give us that power. And that power is to, for love and self-control. In Galatians chapter 5, fruits of the spirit. You know what? Those fruits of the Spirit, when you allow the Holy Spirit to work in you, fill you up, and let it overflow, you know what? Those fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5 about love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control against such which there is no law. Because there isn't. How can, you, how, can be, how can there be a law against love? It, it just doesn't make sense. A law against joy, peace, patience, kindness to one another. Goodness and faithfulness. Well, you know what? This world's going to turn what's good to evil. I don't know how they're going to be able to do it, but it's going to happen. And woe to them that do that, that call kindness. Just because you're reaching out and helping somebody, no, that's not right. That's not right. You go back to that man in the pool, Bethesda. You know what? He received a gift. He was healed. Nope. Pharisees are on. Nope, 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 nope. Can't do that. That's on the Sabbath. Doesn't work that way. Nope. Can't do that. But no, you know what? The fruit of the Spirit, when we have this Holy Spirit filling us, and moving within us, these things are going to come. They will come. Ephesians 3, 16, it says, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner man. How many want that? How many of you want that power? To have that excitement, to have that glory. To, and it's not glory in of ourselves, but it's of God himself dwelling in us and showing the world. We've got something better. There is something better than what this world has to offer. Ephesians 4. But do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed from the day of redemption. But let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander be put away from you along with malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. You realize that when we do these things, you actually grieve the Holy Spirit. You actually, I don't know any other word for grieve. I don't know a synonym for grieve. But grieving the Holy Spirit. You're letting the Spirit down. You're, you're, you're doing things that it's like, why? Why do you want to try to, how far can we go? How far can we get away with? What things can we do? It isn't about that. These things, just put them away. Put them away. Let these things and grow. Allow the Spirit, let God pour His Holy Spirit in you to fill your cup up so that it will overflow. First Corinthians. For who knows a person's thought except the spirit of that person? Except for God. If you think about it, I think of the story of Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar wanted his is uh, astrologers and wise men tell me my dream and its interpretation uh, how are we supposed to do that Duh, i don't know well you're gonna die you're gonna chop your head off 
And that's what it was. But Daniel, in himself, Daniel testified too. I can't do it either. But you know what? He seeked God. God gave him the answer. And then Nebuchadnezzar, when, he, when Daniel got to testify that, Nebuchadnezzar believed not only, yes, if you can tell me what I dreamed, I'm going to believe your interpretation. But you know what? For who knows a person's thought except for the spirit of that person? For the most part, I do not know what Brother Pete Epp is thinking right now, other than, I don't know. Other than, I don't know. <laughs> but you know yourself. I don't know. But which is in him. So also no, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except that the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit of who is from God, that we may understand the things freely given us by God. Want to understand God's plan for your life? Let the Holy Spirit work in you. And watch what happens. Watch where he's going to take you. See, have your eyes open to see opportunities that may come about. You know what? There are some of us that may be called to go. Go different places. Maybe not here. But it starts, let's be faithful with the little things that we've got so that we can be faithful with much when given to us. First Corinthians, again, it says that we impart these in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. And again, you can talk about Jesus all day, but you know what? When you talk about the world, and sometimes you, this is where I, I, I think about, you know, evangelism 101, when Jesus was at the well with this woman. And Jesus is telling all these things, that you, and this woman's just not getting it. You know, give me this water, give me this bucket, or give me this water so that I don't have to come back here. And then, of course, so Jesus switches it up a little bit and says, oh, go go call your husband. Well, yeah, you're right. You, you're not living. You don't, The man you're living with is not your husband. You've had X number of men before. And all of a sudden, ding, she's catching on. And a lot of times that's what we need to do because this world is not going to get what we're saying. They're not going to comprehend God's plan for their life. But this is where a lot of times if we can direct it and show them and apply it to them that they might start seeing different things. And then, of course, because they're spiritually dead, how can we expect them to discern spiritual things when they are spiritually dead? But we impart these words that are not taught by human wisdom, but are taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Of course, in Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost arrived, this is, of course, when they got it, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came the sound of a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and the tongues of fire were appeared that appeared and rested upon each of them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. How many here want to have an upper room experience? We can have that every day. We can have that every day. We want God to do that work, not just on Sunday morning, not just on Sunday afternoon when we leave and go have fellowship. We want it every day in our workplaces because you know what? It's not just on Sunday. It's every day and all day. Romans chapter 8, that if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, cups turn the correct way, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. The very spirit that rose Christ from the dead is the same spirit that now dwells within us. The spirit of God, the spirit of truth is now dwelling in us. Is that not? Does that not motivate you? Does that not? It's like, we've got something that is so much better than what this world has to offer. I remember the days, Monday morning was hangover day. It was the worst day of the week because the weekend was for myself. But it isn't the case anymore. I remember the days when I used to work at Sifton. I would come in and I was the most chipper on Monday morning. Everybody else were dragging their feet because of the weekend that they had. Did you not have a good weekend? Oh, I did, but oh, I'm suffering the consequences of it. I'm suffering my consequences too. I'm rejoicing. Hallelujah. I got recharged at church. Oh, what's church? And I got the opportunities to share. I remember one of them asking when we had tent meetings. We we're doing them out here. And she said, what's a tent meeting? Well, let me tell you something. <laughs> she didn't talk to me again after that, but that's okay. Plant the seeds and let's see what God does to give you increase. And Acts chapter 2, it says, And Peter said unto them, this is, of course, at the sermon. He's... They've come out. They've received the Holy Spirit. They're speaking in tongues. People are witnessing what's going on. It's like, what, what, what must we do? Well, you know what Peter says to them? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For it is a promise. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. Everyone 
whom the Lord our God calls to himself. He's calling everybody. It's God's will that all men be saved. Question is, who wants to be on board? I am. I want to be on board. And you know what, children? I know that you right now, these are the things where you're here every Sunday because mom and dad drag you potentially over here. Maybe you are excited when we get a children's lesson like Brother Jake did, and I didn't even see where he was until I saw him tucked in here. <laughs> I say amen to that, brother. Thank you. But you know what? God's got a plan for your life. That's right. God's got a plan for your life. The question is, is that do you want to get on board? Ephesians 5, it says, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. You know what? You could apply that drunkenness. You could apply it with anything. Anything sin. Sin is going to hinder the Holy Spirit doing the work in you because that's going to take priority over God. This is where our cup, you could imagine a cup and I could throw all kinds of rocks and all kinds of items in there and then God fills it up. But you know what? In reality, it's only about a quarter full. The rest of it's full of other stuff. And we may find ourselves being distracted and you find yourself, why am I not fruitful? Or why am I not being blessed? Why am I not encouraged? Why am I in this place where I am in? And it gets to the point where it's like, no. I need to realize and acknowledge and know I am a child. I'm beloved. I am a child of God and the Holy Spirit. Lord, I need you to fill me. And that's sometimes what we need to do is ask him to, because he'll freely give it. Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. I know I've got it, but I need a filling so that I can move forward. And walk, not in my own strength, but in your strength. Just a couple more here. In John 16, and again, this is at the tail end of his life. That I still have many things to say, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father is mine, therefore I have said that he will take what is mine and declare to you. This is the reminder that he is. You'll find the Holy Spirit when you're looking for words, things to say. You know what? If Brother John ends asks you to share, you know what? I got nothing to share. I beg to differ. I beg to differ. If you are a child of God and you are reading in God's word, I beg to differ what's going on. Step forward. Maybe this point you need to step out in faith and say, Lord... I'm not sure how I'm going to do this or how it's going to come about, but I'm going to need your Holy Spirit to teach me, remind me, show me what I need to speak on and be words of utterance to the congregation. That all of us be blessed and encouraged and strengthened and edified. That's right, Mr. Penner. I still remember you when you stepped up there. I was blessed with your sharing. <laughs> so the question comes down to is, how can we get to know the Holy Spirit? First and foremost, we have to be yielded. Is God your master? Is, I'm asking the question, is God your master? Is the Lord Jesus your Lord and King? Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. 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 That's, right. That's first and foremost one of the priorities. You've, to have the Holy Spirit, you've got to be yielded to God's plan through his son, Jesus Christ. Do you realize getting to know the Holy Spirit a lot of times, if we, and we gather together here, this is another thing, is gathering together, not forsaking the assembling of the saints. Because you know what? God knows it's good for us to be together. He knows that for those that are coming here unconverted, that faith comes by hearing of the word, and that maybe there is somebody here that has been pondering and wondering what mom and dad have experienced. I want it too. But I'm not sure how. This is where you get the opportunity to talk to your parents. But sometimes the preaching of the word will stir the hearts. And it's the Holy Spirit that can do that convicting. Will stir you within, knowing that I am not right with God. How can I do? What must I do to be saved? As what they said when Peter was out there. They called out to him, but we just crucified the Messiah. What must we do to be saved? Prayer is another. I want to encourage you, those that are in prayer groups, don't forsake the prayer groups. They are a blessing, no matter what time they're at. If you can make it to the best of your ability, do so, because you will not regret it. Obeying his word is also another thing. Being that yielded individual, we want to be obeying his word, obeying the words of Jesus, because they are the words of life. And the Holy Spirit is only going to remind us of the words of Jesus, which are the words of life. 
and how we're supposed to conduct ourselves and walk in today's life. To be moved by the Spirit. To be walking in the Spirit. And sometimes it means walking in faith. I don't know how this is going to work out, but this is part of faith. And this is what makes it exciting sometimes. I don't know how this is going to end. But hallelujah, God's in control. I'm walking by faith. Holy Spirit, you better be teaching and guiding me because I don't know what this is going to do. Reading and obeying his word, of course, these are the things that really comes down to imputing in our lives and getting to know God better and getting to know the Lord Jesus better and now also getting to know what the Holy Spirit has got for us to do. I've got one more verse that I want to read. This is kind of the last one and we'll close. In the book of Revelation, chapter 22, the Spirit and the Bride say, this is Jesus and the Holy Spirit say, come. It says, come. And let the one who hears say, come. Those that have already said it, that have ears, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who desires to take of the water of life without price. This doesn't cost us anything, but you realize it will. It costs us nothing, but it does everything. I want to encourage you. In your prayer, your quiet time, ask the Lord for pouring out of the Holy Spirit upon your life. Ask the Lord. Maybe you'll hear the sound of a mighty rushing wind. Open the windows. Maybe we'll get it. I don't know. <laughs> but the fact is, God will freely give it to us. All we got to do is ask. And he can pour it out upon us. And we don't have to just have the Holy Spirit, but we can be filled with the Holy Spirit that our cup would runneth over. And then we have rivers of living water flowing out of us that we don't have to be stale, dead, stagnant water. But we can be living. Because that's God's plan for us. That's what he wants us to do. He doesn't, he doesn't want a bunch of robots. <laughs> he would have made us that way. Then we wouldn't have gone through all this. But you know what? He wants a people that are zealous for him. That want to do the works that he's preordained for us to walk in because we know he's been saved by his mercy and his grace. But he's got a plan for us to do while we're on this earth. The question is, is that we want to get on board. And in order to get on board, we're going to need an anointing from God. And that's where that Holy Spirit's going to come in. And it's going to not only dwell within us, but it's going to fill us. And then the only way to get overflowing is to get full and let it go. And let her go. Because God will, he, his cup's on, our cup's limited. He's Niagara Falls. Good luck trying to catch that. It's going to go everywhere. So we get multiple cups. Let's get everybody involved. Let's everybody get, let's get filled. Let's pray. Father in heaven, again, Lord, we just thank you for your plan of salvation through your son. And I thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit that allows us to be comforted, Lord, that would dwell within us, Lord, that it's no longer on the outside, but it's from within. And Lord, I just want to pray for those that may be here, as we said earlier, that may be just feeling discouraged, downtrodden. Father, we know that we're beloved. We are called your children. And we know that you are a good father and that you will give us what we ask. Father, I'm asking for an anointing of the Holy Spirit. I'm asking, Lord, that you fill us up and to be moving us from within. Father, that you would take us places, say things, and do the things that you've called us to do. Because, Lord, in of ourselves, we can do nothing. And out of the flesh, we know that it, it reaps corruption. Lord, we want to have life. We want to have that life more abundant. The words of Jesus, Father, we ask that you would do a work that only you can do. And I thank you, Lord, for this time we have together. Glory, honor, and praise is always to you in the name of your son, Jesus, because you're worthy. It's in his name I pray. Amen. Amen. I think that was, that was it. You are dismissed.